One one high fly ball. Deep right field. Backing up Eaton and that one is out of here. No sad. He crushed it. And the Red Sox have taken the lead. Bitch, put some respect on my name. When you speak on me, you speak on the guy. Welcome to Smack Talk, guys. Today in studio with me is a absolute veteran of the broadcasting industry and host of his own podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, David Schellenberg. Hello. Well, thank you. It's great to be on your little show. Thank you, sir. So let's get it started. What uh, do you have here for us today? Uh, well, I've got a, a bunch of remnants from various segments that we've done over the years. Okay. And I think... Uh, kind of once we get going, once we get into it, okay. we'll have to explore this. I, I don't know if we need to explore this right away. It's just like what you are on a first date where you see yeah. something sitting there and you're like, I want to get my tongue all over that before <laughs> before I even have a conversation with somebody. Is yeah. that the way kind of guy you are? Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I get right to it, man. Uh, I see. Well, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I'll, I'll give you a, I'm a little bit of a tease. Okay. We have to let it sit there for a minute or two before you yeah. get to see what it is. Yeah, a little eye candy. Yeah, right? there you go. Perfect. What initially attract you? Attracted you, sorry, to the uh, broadcasting industry. I, I think a lot of it is the the feeling of having something to say and wanting to stand up and say it. Uh, <laughs> an, an old boss of mine used to point out that if if you're a performer, if you're a storyteller, you will literally stand on a street corner, on a box, on the floor, whatever it is, and and tell stories over and over and over again. Like there there is something inside a lot of us that just has this feeling that we got to go out and and share yes. what we know. Totally agree. When somebody can actually come along and and pay you to do it, that's always kind of a really nice surprise when you can actually turn it into a living. And and that is not easy to do. And there's very few jobs in the world to the, to this day where people actually 100% make a living off of it. Wow. And podcasting. What do you prefer? For from being live on a microphone in the mornings or in the afternoons or yeah, whatnot yeah. to being alone in a studio or with somebody else podcasting. Well, you think about where radio is like radio for the most part was uh, a couple of us in the studio mm -hmm. from six in the morning till till nine in the morning, five to ten, whatever the hours are that that somebody does. In the era of radio at the moment, there's there's no operators, there's no producers. It's just kind of a, a group of, of individuals that come together and do a show. So you're very much talking to each other as you do it. There is something wonderful about being live. I don't particularly like being recorded. Like, I, <laughs> I, I don't like the, the thought of not being able to talk about what is exactly happening at this moment the, the one of the best things about radio was and still is the immediacy of it if if something is happening in the city like what what radio does better than any other medium ever has really ever figured out is the ability to talk about it right now as it happens oh. and to share that with I don't know, pick a number, 10,000, 100,000 people who are listening to it. And, and I just love being able to talk about current events in that way. Podcasting doesn't do that. I find whenever I make a podcast, I always have the, the evergreen thought in my head. What, whatever it is we're going to have to talk about should be relevant today, should be relevant a month from now, a year from now, two years from now. And, and we have even seen this on podcasts, right, where a lot of times something that was recorded – Months and months and months ago, suddenly, for whatever reason, goes viral and becomes a big thing. What was it that they did that made it viral at that moment? Who knows? It, it clicked and it went in. So podcasting has a definitely a different beast to it. And, and I just prefer the immediacy of being live. Wow. And the, the beast, okay, the viewership, there's, you know, an absolute difference between radio and podcasting. Do you think radio is, in a sense, dying? Um. Uh, Yes. Yeah. It, it's not so much that radio is dying. I think that radio peaked. Radio peaked okay. a couple of years ago. I don't think they're different beasts at all. You know, uh, this sort of a, a conversation that we are doing and then sharing with other people. Radio's done this for what? 150 years at this point? Like, yeah. the, we're not doing anything new. The, the method that we are using to distribute the conversation has changed. You think about some of the classic radio that, that the CBC, for example, has, has done for literally decades is a lot of it is just some great conversations. You know, that's entirely what their morning shows are and their afternoon shows, their daytime shows are based on is, is sometimes some very long form conversations with individuals that, that they take and share across the country. So how we've maybe tweaked this a little bit in, in that uh, it's, it's now recorded, it's now on demand, as opposed to something that you had to be there to hear at that particular moment in time. But there's nothing new with what we're doing. Hmm. 
And you've been doing this for how long now? I first started when I was 15, wow. and I'm 53 at the moment. So like in, in some sort of way, there was always a feeling of wanting to get out there and, and do something. Like you're saying, like to be a storyteller, even if it's standing on a street corner, whether you get paid for it or not becomes irrelevant. But, but you have something that you want to say. And, and you, know, you have to admit, you sort of like the limelight of it. Like you like the fact that people are listening to what you're saying. There's, there's, there's a high to that. And you also just sort of like to figure out exactly how it is you're going to give back in the world. There, there are a lot of people out there who are, are teachers or construction workers or whatever it is they do, accountants and doctors and lawyers and airline pilots, and I'm, I'm none of that stuff. So you've always got to find your place in the world. Hmm. Through, doing, uh, through all those years of broadcasting, have you met anybody that like, blew your mind, like a, a really interesting connection? You, you do meet a couple of people like a, along the way. You know, the first time you met Justin Trudeau, like, and, he, and then the guy actually comes into the studio and and sort of stands there, and yeah. and you realize how tall he is. And and uh, with so many politicians, you you start to understand that they are completely different people in person than you expect them to be, because mm -hmm. there's there's always this this certain uh, way that that other people talk about them, you know, somebody, and you see this in the news all the time, where you know this is what actually happened, but this is what really happened, and then when you're actually in the room where it really, yeah. yes, <laughs> but then when you're in the room when it happened, you yeah. go, no, that's not the way that happened at all. Like I, I was in the room, and that's not the way that it went down. So, so there's a lot of these individuals with politicians who you think you know what you're going to get into, and and then all of a sudden. They are completely different people. Uh, on the show, we had Rick Mercer, you know, classic yeah. Canadian, Canadian comedian, on many, many times. Newfie. And yes, and and you start to realize when you hang out with him, like he's just in this to have some fun as well, which is sort of one of the best things about a lot of these people. So it's it's those individuals that I think are true surprises. Wow, and you do you do really get a high from it, honestly. Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It does it does feel really good, man. That rush of like, oh my god, like I don't know. Maybe there's some some somebody listening somewhere. You yeah. Know I mean? you know. Have you been recognized yet? Uh, yeah, at the yeah. at the gym for sure because I go there every day. So of course. Yeah. 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 So your boys are listening. All My the time. boys are oh, listening. Hey, listen. hey, hey boys. Yeah, hey boys. Yeah. 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 Hi. How's it going? <laughs> My girl's listening for sure. Oh, My good. number one supporter. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, it's really important, man, for what you do because sometimes uh, the views aren't there. But uh, hey, fuck it, man. Consistency. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. It is funny when you when you do get noticed at these things because like you, be standing, you must be noticed. You get noticed all the time. You, you get noticed, uh, and it, it's you're never entirely sure. Like uh, a, a buddy of mine, I actually. He noticed me at the gym, and the way I tell the story, I was naked and changing at the time of the change room. <laughs> but he he literally did the. Uh, Are you David Schellenberg? And it's like, yeah. And it was just because he happened to have seen something and gone and looked up. So he he called me out. At least I will say this when I was naked. Whether I was not is irrelevant, but <laughs> but it makes a good story. But but sometimes you'll be in the grocery store and you'll be you know looking through the oranges, trying to find the good oranges, and there'll be somebody staring at you, and you're trying to figure out: Are you looking at me because you recognize me, yeah. or do you want me to get the hell out of the way so you yeah. can find the or oranges? Or you really like oranges? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 See, so you never really know sometimes what's going on. <laughs> you ready to see what this wine is? Fuck yeah, let's go. So uh, one of the things that we have done that we did on the radio for for years and years and years was a booze segment yeah, of sorts, of course, and. Yeah, everybody does a booze segment. Yeah. It's easy to do. And you start to realize that it's it's very normal to have somebody come on and, and talk about alcohol in some way. Mm -hmm. And along the way, we start to figure out that, that booze is one thing, but food and booze is even better. And then you saw that a whole lot of segments that, that when people do that, it's it's really pretentious as possible. And they'll they'll talk about some something really expensive paired with something really expensive for food that nobody makes. So we started to think, well, what if you just sort of took Normal, easy to fair, find wines, and paired that with normal, easy to find foods, and then all of a sudden Hence you've got the something. Big Mac. Hence the Big Mac on a Tuesday the night. The Big Mac. The Big Mac. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's a McDonald's right around the corner from here that I stopped and got Big Macs on the way. Yeah. And I specifically ordered two Big Macs. Yeah. Didn't think to look in the bag because how can McDonald's screw this up? How can McDonald's screw this up, right? And there oh is, boy, they did. Then there is only one Big Mac in the bag. <laughs> But but it's the hey, grand inflation, Big Mac. man. Inflation. So it's a Big Mac. It's a big Big Mac. It is. So we'll be fine. Hell yeah. The uh, so one of the best ways that we've ever done this segment was what we called fast food fine wine. So we're taking in this particular case two very pretentious French wines hmm. and pairing them with a the Big Mac. Hmm. 
So there are some French people who are not going to be at all happy with oh, this. Oh, no, for sure. So which one do you think? Do you want to do the Ventoux or do you want to do the, the Bordeaux? Mm. I go by look. Okay. <laughs> Because okay. I don't really know wine that much, so I go by logo. Okay. Um, the one with the beige logo looks pretty nice. It looks it looks this almost one? like royalty. You know what I mean? Yeah. It Look. looks like Napoleon's stash. Excellent. Yeah. So you pick the cheaper of the two. <laughs> <laughs> of course I do. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, now, one of the fun things about doing these sort of bits is they don't always work. <laughs> well... Whatever. Go with the flow, right? Yeah. Flow like water or exactly. flow like uh, Bordeaux. Bordeaux. No, Ventoux. Ventoux. Okay. Yeah. So we'll try the Ventoux, provided it opens. The, and it's kind of fun with these segments. Like, I, uh, if, if you look at some of the other podcasts that I've got, there's one that's been posted as well. Here, I'll just give you a ball. Yeah, yeah good idea. The, where we actually just did a segment where we paired rosé with chicken wings. Ooh. And another one where we paired, um, uh, what was it? It was um, bubbly of some sort okay. with uh, Ripple's potato chips, Ring, uh, Pringles potato chips. Huh. So there's a lot of this stuff out there that actually works Rose really well. Rosé with chicken wings. Rosé with chicken wings. Huh. And I always, I always find personally after doing these segments for so long, uh, rosé is a great wine for turkey. Really? Yeah. So you like pairing fancy wines with very simple food. You think that, like, I don't know, why do they pair it with, like, the most complicated dishes that we will never, re like, you know, do I, ourselves? <laughs> I honestly have no idea. Yeah. And, and I, you, you know, you watch some of these segments on some shows, and it's, it's you know, they bring in a, a $27 bottle of something. Yeah. And then uh, pair it with chicken cordon bleu or something ridiculous, and you think, you know, no. <laughs> when am I ever going to make that, you know? When am I going to make it? Or how am I possibly going to do it? When some of the simplest things that you want are, you know, the daily things. So, like, this Ventu, this is a $13 bottle. Hmm. It's not, a, well, 13 in the LCBO. So 13 in Ontario. In Quebec, it's probably $26. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. At the, at the SAQ. <sighs> Seriously, the SAQ and the LCBO is always kind of entertaining. I know. It's it's insane. For it's French. It must be more money. Exactly. That's what it's for, right? You pay for the language. Yeah. That's what it's language tax. That's well, it you also you always like what's what's where you came from. So I, yeah. I, I understand how in Quebec, if it's a wine from France, it it must be good. <laughs> Therefore you must charge more for it. Where are you from? I grew up in Winnipeg, so okay. so that's where home is. I was born in the United States, so I'm, I'm a dual citizen. Really? Yeah. Where, where in the United States? Iowa. Iowa. Cool. Are you a Hawkeyes fan? That's a very uh, far... I pulled that out of my ass. Well, very good. Very good. Uh, no, I'm a Cyclones fan. Oh. Because Iowa State is yep. literally where I was born, so... Yeah. Did you ever grow up... You grew up watching football, or no, where you didn't... Well, growing up, yeah, absolutely. Like okay. growing up in in uh, in Winnipeg, the Vikings are, are yeah. the closest team to Winnipeg, so that tends to be the team that you keep an eye on. And the, you know, the Vikings had a bunch of bad years, but this past couple of years have been very good. Yeah. So it's it's hard to avoid football at the moment. And when did you come to Ottawa? Two thousand two. Okay. So at the point now where I've been here. I've been here long enough that I remember when that Kelsey's was a Tim Hortons guy. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Holy shit. I know that street corner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, you love the city? You like the city? Are you a fan of the city? Oh, yeah. It's a beautiful city. Yeah. It, it's, it's a beautiful city. It's, it's, uh, I, I like the size of it. I, I like the, the vibe of the city. I get frustrated when people talk about Ottawa as the city that fun forgot because... You're clearly not hanging out with me. Like, I, <laughs> I, I believe you, sir. <laughs> I, there always seems to be something fun to do. If if you are determined to not have fun, then I think you will find it. I, I think a, a lot of the trick with Ottawa is is people sometimes sort of expect to be invited to things, and Ottawa is not very good for actually opening or, or sending out invitations and saying, you know, you should come and join us for something. But Ottawa is very, what Ottawa is very good at is if you walk into a bar, if, if you join a sports league, if you walk into a gym, whatever it is, you, you can walk into something and chat with the person next to you and make a friend quite easy and easily. And I do That's find true. Ottawa is very unique for that. It's, everybody here 
is super friendly. Everybody here is super confident and, and likes to have a conversation. It's you just got to make that you know that initial step. You know. Yes, you you've got to join that sports league. You've got to join that euchre league. You've got to join that curling league. Whatever it is that you want to do, nobody's going to invite you to do it. But if you just go sign up, even as an individual. You're going to go find a bunch of friends. Hmm. I needed your opinion on this. Oh, uh, yeah. What is your opinion on the Ottawa Red Black, sir? Um, <laughs> okay, you're going to have to give me more work on that. In what way? <laughs> Do they have a chance? It's the CFL. Of course they have a chance. I mean, in general. Organizational. Like, you know, the organization. Like, what? what is your opinion on the Ottawa Red Blacks? I'm a fan. I, I go to, you know, but I, I don't know. I have this love-hate relationship with the CFL. Okay. Because uh, they don't have four downs. Right. And I pay $130 to go see punts. Yes. Uh, sometimes I'm not, like, the biggest fan of that. Yeah, you know I, mean? I will cheers you on that one. <laughs> yeah, there, there you go. Right. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. they need to stop doing that. That's good. Very good. It's – yeah, I agree. It's there, – there's a reason why you have four downs, and that would make it a little more entertaining. It would change the league exponentially. Yes. I, I'm fine with the bigger balls. I'm fine with the size yeah. of the field. I'm fine – you know, the placement of the uprights, whoever thought to put them in the field instead of, like, it's debatable. further yeah. back, I, I could see the logic of the way the, the NFL does it. Well, mm -hmm. let's not put this somewhere where somebody could run into it. Yeah. You know, so there's there's a couple of little things there that, that I'm fine with, but I do get tired of the, the kicking. <laughs> it's always kicking. How many games have you got to this year? Uh, three. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did, you, did we win in any of them? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Two. Nice. Yep. And then I had the. I went to the game where uh, Crumb showed up. It was, oh, It's cool. Crumb time in Ottawa now, baby. Yeah. It's Crumb time. And uh, yeah. Uh, but last game uh, I saw, it was raining, and they lost on the final play against. Was it Hamilton? Was it Hamilton? Could have been. Yeah, I think it was Hamilton. The. Uh, I was at that Crumb game too. Yeah. We left early. Because, of course, we sucked in the first half, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. And that was the night at Blues Fest that had Pitbull. Yeah. So the group of us, and it was $5 margaritas at mm -hmm. Blues Fest if you went early. So yeah. <laughs> we figured we, we were lost. It was a new guy. There was, well. there was nothing there to see, yeah. and we wanted to go to, to Blues Fest. So we left. And then that turned out to have been, like, the game of the decade, which just sort of proves part of the fun of sports is is you're never going to know where it's all going to find where it's all going to go. Mm. Last year I had season tickets to the Red Blacks and they were kick-ass season tickets. I was like in row one. What a season! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and we didn't win a single single game. You know, I had a great time at every single yeah, game. Yeah, of course. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was in the little fancy dancy club section that includes yeah, yeah. food and yep. the food was fine. Yep. The people you sat next to were fine. Mm -hmm. Like the the bar I think everything was fine. Except we didn't win a single game. It's just had enough of this crap. I know, man. We have to have nice things in Ottawa. <laughs> But we went all the way. Like, yep. you know, uh, Henry Burris. Uh, did you ever meet Henry Burris? Absolutely, I did. Yeah. I met him. I used to work security at the uh, TD place. Oh. That was like, my, like one of my first jobs. Right. I met Henry Burris, and he's a great man. Great uh, man. Phenomenal. Yeah. You know, and, and so those years when the, when the Red Blacks went on and, and won the Grey Cup, mm -hmm. absolutely amazing. And yeah. you sort of figure, all right, we've got it all covered. No way. And then it all changes. Yeah. He announced his retirement, and, uh, you know, that's what happened to Ottawa after that. Yeah. Wah, wah, wah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow, where are your security at, at TD Place? Yeah, I used to be a bouncer, too. How long did you last at that? Uh, about a year, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, and then I uh, went to go work at the casino. Which one? Uh, La Clemie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I worked there for uh, four, five, four years. Yeah. We were actually having conversations the other night about uh, how everybody seems to get kicked out, and then a month later they come back again. <laughs> well, the security is not the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna. Whatever, we're not gonna. No, go no, that. no, no. I agree. We're, we're not gonna. This is not the point of this conversation. But, no. but it does seem to be a lot of stories about. <laughs> Didn't you get kicked out of the casino a month ago? Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I did. So, how are you back in? Mm -hmm. Just walked in, <laughs> sat down, and started playing. Yeah, broadcasting and journalism—they go hand in hand. Yeah. Did you? What is your background? And do you have a background in journalism? No, not at all. No. So you just went right, right into broadcasting. Well, I started volunteering in you know community access television, so the Rogers Twenty Two okay, yeah, of, yeah. of the world, when I was in high school, and then that got me enough contacts in the industry that by the time I graduated high school, high school, could start freelancing, get some odd jobs along the way, and just kind of kept rolling along. Like this does happen to be an industry where you can where experience is everything. So how you get your experience, and and some of the best ways to do that is to go to school. 
where you do have access to good gear, good equipment, good mentors who will tell you what you did right and what you yeah. did wrong. The other way is to just do it and and find places who will mentor you and take you in and and you know use you to a certain extent because when you're volunteering at Rogers 22, you know, you're working for a monolithic billion dollar company yeah. and it'd be nice if they could give you a piece of pizza or ten dollars or something so you you do feel a little bit frustrated that that you are helping a massive corporation make more money on the other hand you're figuring it out and the the tools and the techniques that they use you're at that level you're not gonna lose it no. no a camera shot is a camera shot the way you frame it up is exactly the same you know the the way these microphones plugged in the way the compression works the way the board works is is all exactly the same at the levels all the way up and down. You know, the cameras might be a little bit higher quality, the tripods might be a little bit better, but the actual fundamentals is is identical. Hmm. Wow. And what uh, what was your first job like um, as a broadcast? Like, who did you work for? It was in, in Winnipeg for a cable company in Winnipeg that that got bought out, so they they no longer exist. But but I had been volunteering with them for for years and years and years. And and when I was in high school, they had a TV show called Homework Hotline. And the, and the whole idea with this was it was twice a week from like five to six o'clock, and and it was a live TV show with teachers in the studio. And right. the idea was kids who were sitting at home trying to do their homework could call up these teachers, <laughs> and through cable television, the teachers would be there and have them on the phone and and have a conversation with them about the homework that it is they're trying to do and it'd be live on tv so you know cable tv so a, a good use of technology where you're not trying to broadcast to everybody but just talk to a, a very narrow yep. group and i started on that as a as a camera operator when i was 17 years old by the time i was 19 year old 19 years old i was directing the show just because the guy who had been directing it for years and years and years moved on to other projects and i had been there long enough and everybody knew who i was and knew who i that i had a feeling of how it all worked and said well why don't you direct it mm -hmm. and and then that was an actual paid job so that that would have been the first official. So you directed at like eighteen? Yeah, nineteen, somewhere around there. After, it was right after high school. So you got uh, you got a couple of years under your belt. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Wow. But but it's 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 so much the same thing over and over and over mm. again. It's 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 understanding the the how to put together a story. You know, the beginning, the middle, end of all this stuff. Knowing where where the peaks and the valleys are, and, and how to pull it all together. And and I think once you sort of get the handle for that, then then it you can transfer that to all sorts of places. What's your most memorable piece of work memorable piece of work i have to think about that one we might have to have a big mac and think about that one for a minute sounds good to me because i have to think about what my most memorable piece of work is well your order right here is a memorable fucking piece of work for yeah sure. so the question becomes what a beautiful cut man oh my god <laughs> yeah one of the things they teach you in broadcast school how to cut a big mac <laughs> yeah. how to share food <laughs> <laughs> which i never went to Mm. So now the question becomes: This is much better on radio when nobody can see you eating. <laughs> Everybody's gonna see us eating. Whatever. <laughs> Go back to the twelve-dollar bottle of wine with a five-dollar Big Mac. I love the concept, man. It's smack talk. Every week is different, so here you go. You're gonna hear me chew today. Big fucking deal. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um. Mm. I think the burger killed the wine. I think it really goes good together. Yeah? Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Well, for a Tuesday? Yeah. Why wouldn't you do that? Seriously, why not? What is the future of podcasting? It will be around till the next thing comes along. Oof. I like that. The, uh, we, we always see, it's, it's never, it's, it's tough to d always define these things. Are these evolutions or these revolutions or is this the next gimmick? I don't know if, if podcasting is, is truly a, an evolution from what broadcasting was doing, you know, because in many ways you're, you're taking stuff that used to have a, a full team of people behind it. So you know, camera operators and sound people and, and producers and directors and stuff. And, and there is something great about that collaboration of everybody working together to something like podcasting where there are but four million podcasts in the world or yeah. 
some stupid number at the moment. It grows every day. Yeah. So you, sure. you could you could under podcasting have the most brilliant podcast of all time that nobody ever sees because it just gets lost in the shuffle. So mm. there's a certain frustration I find in in podcasting in that there's too much content and and nobody finds it. Do you so think promoting if, the yeah, podcast is that's is, the thing? Yeah. So if you don't use social media, like you're pretty much signing up for nobody to watch. Well, how, yeah. How many people will watch the podcast versus how many people will watch the reel promoting the podcast? And 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 a lot of times it's it's the ninety second clip, it's the sixty second clip. Like like talk about sports. I know so many people who don't watch the game but will watch the highlights and then feel that they have watched the game. Hmm. And the reality is, especially with something like like sports, to actually go along for the ride of we're up, we're down. The Red Blacks game on on Sunday night, yeah. like. Up and down. Yes, that was yeah. up and down. Right literally down to the last minute of the game. Mm-hmm. You know, was that going to be us or or not? Or Saskatchewan? And to watch the highlights of it is nowhere near as fun as sitting down and watching that thing for two hours. Of course not. And so you look at something like podcasting is the same in a roundabout way to get back to podcasting. So there there is so much content out there that that gets lost in the shuffle that that what worries me about podcasting is how sustainable is it because there is so much content and then the other thing that worries me about podcasting is everybody is getting paid in the in this podcast that we are making except us you know the the people who are if if, this is, if somebody's watching this on YouTube, YouTube got paid for it. The, the people who made the microphone got paid for it. The people who made the lights got paid for it. The people who made the desk got paid for we're it. We're the last one, and we don't get paid for it. If not, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we're doing this just for the fun of it. So Absolutely. I do sort of wonder sometimes with podcasting, does this honestly have a future, or is it just going to get to the point where nobody can afford to do this because we actually have to put our time in, into going out and making a living instead of just having some fun sitting drinking wine on TV? Do you consider, like, radio hosts or, you know, what I'm doing, podcasters, artists? Mm. Absolutely. How so? Absolutely. Because, um, uh, because it's storytelling. You know, it's it's it's... It's putting together thoughts and concepts and ideas, putting them together in an original sort of way. That, that, yeah. I, the, the anybody who who takes a whole bunch of pictures and words and sounds and jumbles that all up together is is an artist of mm. sorts, and and you you can't deny that. So there, and art comes in so many different ways. I, to ask if somebody's an artist is is tough to define, just because you know. Some people do a lot of things that I don't know if I really consider to be art. However, eh, you know, somebody made this. That's sure. art. Yeah, that's art. Do you know who who has made that? No. Well, no. I'd say that's art. Yeah. I don't know if I'd buy that. But it is. But art. it is art. Yeah. Wow. So it's not. There's no. There's no box to be put in for art. No. You know, every everything is unique, and whatever you put out there, as long as it's true to you. Yeah. That's what makes it art. Like I like the the analogy I was making with the Mona Lisa. You know, same concept is, you know, yes, there's one. Is Mona Is that Lisa. in the podcast or is that before the that podcast? That was before the podcast. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's one Mona Lisa. Right. And of course, it's not perfect, but you can't do the Mona Lisa again. No. You know, it was made once. Right. And that's what makes it perfect. That's what makes it art. That's what makes it beautiful. That's what makes it human. Yes. But the question I think that I'll throw to you for the Mona Lisa is, is it truly the best painting in the world? No, oh, no. Is, is the is the best selling uh, single of all time the best song that's ever recorded? Is is the biggest movie uh, movie ever made for in terms of box office? The best movie of all time? You know, the highest revenues for all these things, the most popular, the best known is is seldom, you know, the one that is truly the best. It just seems mm-hmm. to be the one that happens to be in the right place at the right time. And we see this. I saw this a lot on on radio where uh, a song comes along from a brand new artist that nobody's ever heard of and and you hear the song you think wow that's a great song that's going to be a huge hit and then it just sort of dissipates dissipates mm. yeah and uh, taylor swift takes over yeah it's taylor swift is making money right now <laughs> <laughs> she is taking over yes man. i know is, is taylor swift an artist yeah 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There are some guys who... who uh, some, Swift Nation, man. Yes, I know. Don't make fun of them. But there, <laughs> there are some uh, uh, individuals who go into a studio with a computer and sort of like mix a whole bunch of things together. Yeah. And they're like, I don't know if you're so much an artist as a mathematician. Hmm. However... You've created something that is is art for a lot of people. Is it is it music? I don't it's art. It is. It all depends on the eye that is beholding. Well, it all depends on the eye that's looking at the um, the art project for sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think a lot of it. We'll talk about like famous paintings over time too. Is is there always needed to be a, a benefactor of sorts behind these things? Yep. So. Whether it's in in our era now, it's it's advertisers like, so we are living in in the, yeah. <laughs> yes, Th this is the era of the advertisers. You know, once upon a time, it'd be some super wealthy person, a, a benefactor who would come along to a Rembrandt or whoever, and say, you know, I will commission you to to make this painting, or sometimes it's the art that sits on the shelf where you go into a store and you see something and you think, wow, I really like that. I'm going to drop a hundred bucks and buy that. In in a lot of the world now. It's an advertiser and trying to appease the advertiser and find whatever it is the advertiser wants in, in their little clickbait headlines or, or their over analytics time that we spend looking for the smallest little detail on why an advertiser would pick this one over that one. And that becomes a little bit different game, for lack of a better point, where you're trying to figure out exactly what it is that the advertiser is looking for so you can actually make some money doing that. This episode is brought to you by Neox Marketing. Are you looking to upgrade your business? Do you want to develop your marketing skills but have no idea where to start? <laughs> Boy, do I have a deal for you. With promo code SMACKTALK, you can get not 25, not 50, not 60, 80% off their marketing ebook. That comes to a total of $2. Yeah, this ebook has everything, okay? It took a year to make, it's simple to use, so you can get started ASAP. So Johnny, you're saying you can get an entire ebook, an entire ebook, a step-by-step -step guide for scaling my business for only $2? That's exactly what I'm saying. With promo code SMACKTALK, you can use it at checkout or click the link in the description. That is promo code SMACKTALK for 80% off your purchase. S-M-A-C-K-T-A-L-K. Tell a friend to tell a friend and enjoy the episode. Peace. Hmm. Back to your most memorable moment. Yeah, I still have tried to think of that one. <laughs> yeah. I know. I was. I, I let you marinate. It. I, it's like, oh, did he forget about it? No, I fucking did it. No, no, no I didn't think he forgot about it. <laughs> the um. <laughs> okay, I'll give you one. That, mm -hmm. that, that, that's just because I got in trouble for it. Okay. So years ago, uh, on the radio, on the radio station, uh, one of the regular. Uh, Standard segments is something we call the good, the bad, and the ugly. So mm -hmm. every single morning, there's a good story, a bad story, and an ugly story. Yeah. And and many, many years ago, I did uh, an example of a bad story, which was a broadcaster in the United States around Christmas time who, for whatever reason, decided to go on their TV show and went on a bit of a Santa Claus rant okay. and how frustrated they were about Santa Claus. Okay. And, and because Santa Claus is not real therefore why does everybody keep talking about santa claus and let oh, it go no so i had presented this as a bad thing that somebody did what i neglected to say is that it was bad because santa claus is obviously real so because i didn't add that little line oh, at the end no. the amount of parents who were listening in the car because you know, it's it's the radio show that we do is is such a subtle nuance though. Like it's a, such a subtle nuance, and I had presented it as a bad story. I had said it was bad that this person did this. What I didn't say it was bad because Santa Claus is clearly real, kids. <laughs> and by the way, Santa Claus is clearly real. Yeah, come yeah. on, man. Like and subscribe. <laughs> the so. The amount of phone calls that we got, the amount of emails that we got, the amount of like sheer complaints, and then you started to realize Death that threats. <laughs> yeah, more or less. Like, you see, you started to realize quite quickly uh, to an adult, I, I, we can have a challenging conversation, but don't mess with your kids. <laughs> yeah. To, you know, look at an adult in the eye, and and you could say, you know, you're wrong on your politics, you're wrong on your music, you're wrong on your art. That's fine. Don't mess with their kids. Like, they do not like that. So 
the fact that there were so many kids sitting in the back seat listening to the conversation and enforcing these weird conversations about Santa Claus, it became the official policy of not just our radio station, of all the hundred radio stations on the chain, that Santa Claus is real and exists. And nobody will ever, ever, ever say anything different in the entire hundred radio stations that are in that company. And that was because of me. <laughs> And you said you got in trouble. What do you what do you mean by got in trouble? Well, you got pulled pull into the boss's office, and okay. then it becomes like not just the boss, but the big boss, and then the big big boss, and then they all went back and you know listened to the actual segment, and and they all agreed that you know it's not that I did anything wrong. So technically, I was in the clear. What I just didn't do was that one extra step, and and that is that realization of. You can just be on the cusp. You, you cannot make any mistakes, and you could still lose. And it's very, very possible to, for that to happen. Oh, my. And what did you, like, can they suspend you or something? Or what, like, what is their, like, big, they just fire you? Yeah, oh, yeah. They okay. can fire you for all sorts of reasons. You know, there's that story just today in, in uh, oh, no, now we're talking about current events. Oh, no. Uh, but you know, that sportscaster in the United States who went on was the Orioles, right, who talked about how bad of a season the Orioles were having, and the owner watched the broadcast and didn't like the fact that, you know, their broadcaster talked about how bad the season was and suspended him for several games. You think that's going getting worse? No, there's nothing new with any of this. Yeah, right. yeah. this is all... This is all a lot of, of large corporations steering things the way they want to hear, which is, which is one thing. Like, corporations tend to be something that you can, can fiddle with a little bit. The, the dilemma always becomes when you have single owners. So in the case of that sportscaster, it's, it's one guy who owns a sports team and didn't. Whatever, and, yeah. Well, we saw this with Melnick a little bit too, right? Mm -hmm. So one guy who owns a sports team and then sees something that that individual doesn't like and then steps in and says something, even if there's a team of people around him that says, you know what, that wasn't the worst thing that happened today, but you can see how sometimes an, an owner will take a, have a concern about something and, and step in and, and go a little bit too far. Speaking about Melnick, what about um, your sense fan? Oh, yeah. Yeah? What do you think about the, the current affairs of the Ottawa Senators, like I, I, in terms of, uh, you know, arena placement, culture, new owner? You know, we would have had our new arena by now, yeah. and it, it would have been downtown. It should have been downtown? It... It has to happen. It has to happen. Oh, I agree. In that's one of the classic stories in the NHL. Is in the entire league, there's only two buildings that aren't downtown, and Ottawa is one of them. The other one's in Florida, and they've managed to build a whole world around it. Yeah. Actually, talk about the CFL. The uh, Red Blacks building is the only building that's downtown in the CFL. Hmm. One of the things that players talk about. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. No, but uh, one of the things that players talk about is how much they like coming to play in Ottawa because they win. But uh, a lot of times it, <laughs> when they, but after the game, like yeah. there's a great collection of stuff on Bank Street there that they all go out and have a really good time in. Go to any other building in the CFL, there's nothing no. right outside the building. So anyway, yeah, buildings should always, they all, you know, put them downtown. That's where, where life is, man. Yes, yeah. yes. When, when I lived in, in Calgary, you know, I lived in Calgary for several mm -hmm. years, and one of the greatest things would be you could arbitrarily decide with the boys like at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, should we go to the Flames game tonight? You know, what's everybody doing? And you could just go out after work, walk over to the arena, see the game, and then go home after the game. And it didn't have to be this epic conversation about, well, how exactly are we going to get there and how are we going to get home afterwards, which is one of the, what this frustration now is. Now you got to drive three hours, take a shuttle, then take a plane, then take a fucking, you know uh, what I mean? It's Metro. ridiculous. Yeah. And, and even in Ottawa, like the, the classic story is they, they never wanted to put the building there. That was like their 20th option on the big long list, but they just kept getting shut down of it's anywhere they wanted. just barren wasteland of fucking <laughs> of abandoned houses. And, Nothing. Yeah. They didn't want it there. No. They, from day one, they did not want it there. They only put it there because they would not, weren't allowed to build anywhere else. And it's it's stupid. So, yeah, it needs to come downtown. Where to put it downtown, if it's going to be Le Breton, I love the thought of putting it where the the D and D HQ building is. Ooh, have you heard I, that one? Yes, I did. But I heard they they wanted to demolish some abandoned houses too um, near Rideau. Well, they want to take down the D and D building. Okay, which I Maybe guess we're talking about the same thing. Uh, yeah, it's probably the same thing because yeah. like that D and D headquarters right downtown next to the convention center. Is apparently half empty at the moment. Yeah, because, okay, that's, we're talking about the same thing. Yeah, because they're all they've all moved out to the old Nortel complex. Yeah, and the building itself is what what I read mm -hmm. is was built so long ago that it is not up to standards 
for accessibility and everything else. Mm -hmm. So for them to continue using it, they have to put literally millions of dollars into the building to, to upgrade it to what the current standards are. Eh, they can just tear it down. Yeah, easier. <laughs> yes. Do you have any inspirations when you were growing up? I always wanted to be a camera guy. Yeah. Like, I, I still think about, of, of all the jobs that I could do, the, the thought of being able to take your camera and, and go around the world and take pictures of stuff. Hike up to the top of the mountain and take a pretty picture of a of a sunrise or a sunset. Capture a moment. Yeah, is is still I think of of all the things that I would would truly love to do. Just it's partly the the travel of it, partly the visual of it, the simplicity of it, mm. and the randomness of it too. Like any anybody who's ever been a photographer knows you you can uh, sit next to a lake trying to get the perfect picture of the loon landing and never get it for hours and hours and hours. But when you finally do get that one shot, it becomes the shot that goes around the world. So yeah. there's there's certainly a love to be able to do something like that. Well, what, what is the future of, um, of radio, in your opinion? Um, or what should they do to help their future? <laughs> well, <laughs> right, right, the difference between radio and podcasting is not huge. You know, what, what, what radio does is, is essentially what podcasting does. Mm -hmm. Radio just... You know, it has a big blinky stick that broadcasts it out to a, a wide variety of people in a, an enclosed area. Podcasting puts it on the internet and sends it to the world. It's I don't I, I think a lot of the question for me is is what's the future of local? Because one of the things that that we are losing as we move from l truly local broadcasters who only ever worried about talking to people in their city to podcasters who you know talk less and less about where exactly they are and just try to find some sort of a conversation that catches on globally you lose a lot in in the local side and and we're seeing this in all cities with the demise of local newspapers the, the, yeah. the demise of the six o'clock news there are fewer and fewer people that actually tell the local stories of the local politicians or or the big pothole on the street or or whatever it is non-biased journalism Yes, yes, because they are truly going out there and just trying to as, as hard as possible to stick to the facts. And, and I, what, what really worries me is we lose the local conversations about the mayor, about the city councillors, uh, about the bylaws, about traffic problems, about the new restaurant that just opened down the street, the new store that's opening up. I have conversations with people all the time who just talk about festivals and events in Ottawa are completely unaware, unaware. that a festival was happening. And they'll say, yeah, we went to this, uh, the fireworks festival is on, you know, in Ottawa. I'll say, I was at the fireworks on Saturday night. And they'll go, what, we have a fireworks festival? I'm like, we've had a fireworks festival in Ottawa for decades. This when you get lost in the internet and you know ads following you around the internet just because you looked at one particular website you you lose what's truly happening in your backyard and and mm -hmm. that's what i worry do you think it's like a a, a dilemma we have uh, as canadians because you you have that background in the in the states and w in your People from Americans tend to be very proud of where they're from. Yes. It could be their hometown, could be whatever, their county or whatever. But here, if I don't know, it's different. It's different in different places, like Newfoundlanders, Quebecers, Absolutely. Albertans. Yeah. Uh, you know, there there is a lot of people who are very proud of what they are. Uh, Quebec, like local in Quebec, is massive. Yes, local radio in Quebec is massive. There, there is a culture. If around you it. speak French, if you speak French, <laughs> that's uh, why the show is bilingual, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, Newfoundland, you mm -hmm. know, local radio in Newfoundland is still a humongous thing. Yeah. Admittedly, because the internet is crappy. So, they, they, <laughs> yep, yes, yep, and absolutely. And, and I've talked to a bunch of people in the United States who have the same place. So, you know, the 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 Montanas and the Texas and stuff, where there is a large area area and very sparse population internet becomes a hard thing to do really well radio on the other hand you put a big stick and you cover hundreds of square miles quite easily and so there is a lot of places in the world where radio is is still massive as a thing so that's why you know when you asked me earlier if radio is dying it's like i don't know if radio is dying it it certainly peaked like i i get the feeling that that a couple of years ago it had more listeners than it it could ever have again. However, I think there is certainly a, a place 
in the world, in our country, developing nations are very big on radio because, you know, once again, it, the infrastructure Global is voice, yeah. is really hard to do. Yeah. But to put a transmitter, FM radios, AM radios at this point are, are very cheap devices, very easy to make, very easy to power, and it's a very good way to get information out. Hmm. Speaking about information too, uh, AI. Uh, you, you, we can see what well, we see. The actors now that are protesting, yeah. uh, the Writers Guild of America. Um, what is your opinion on AI? Do you think it's going to take us take us over, or, or there's nothing like uh, the uniqueness of a human being? I think it's like uh, it, it's yet another tool, and you have to learn how to use the tool properly. And everybody has to learn to use a tool. And we saw this. Um, like just through my lifetime, I think when calculators came along, mm -hmm. you know, when, when I was 10, 11, or 12, you would sit in school and they would drill math tables into our heads. So it's ask a 12 year old now what is six times seven, they'll look at you with a phone. What? Yeah, why would I need to know this? Yeah. <laughs> I, there's no need for me to know this information. Yeah. And then, so, you know, calculators came along and there was a worry oh, calculators are going to destroy the world. And they didn't. Then the internet comes along and Google's come along and and, you know, oh, is that going to destroy education? Is that going to destroy art? And, and it didn't. You know, I think Google sort of wrecked some good bar conversations where, yeah. you know, before you could look up the answers on your phone, you and, you and your friends would sit around and argue for hours and nobody could prove or disprove anything. Now you just look at your phone and you know what the answer is quite quickly. So where to put... AI into all this mix. I don't know if we really know yet. A AI has got a place. AI is is not a new concept. There's been a whole bunch of developments in technology over the past couple of years that, that have allowed it to expand quite quickly. How to find its place, how to use it. My, my biggest frustration with AI is I'm still not entirely certain if it has ever come up with anything new. The entire concept of AI was it went around and scraped the internet and found things that humans had already done and just takes them and repackages them yep. when, and calls it AI. And so there's a certain frustration. And it learns from all the bullshit that's out there. Yes. <laughs> you know? And it presents everything in yep. such a way that, that, you know, as far as the AI is concerned, it's the truth. Where I think... We, we have a tendency to listen to AI and assume it's, it's done its job quite properly. The reality is you sort of have to go and fact check and, and double check it to, to know what it's telling you. When you look at, at stories and things that AI writes, they're crappy. It's terrible. They're horrible. Yeah. You know, there's four million podcasts in the world made by humans. Yeah. A lot of them are horrible as well. Absolutely. We just seem to be able to accept the fact that that humans are are not perfect, and we have to realize that AI is the same way. That's what makes us beautiful. Yes, exactly. Every single one of us. The evolution of technology, though, from when you started yeah. to now, currently, like what what did you use in the beginning? Uh, it's it's still very much what it is. Like you know, if if we would have been doing this. A while ago, these lights would have been much hotter and much brighter. The cameras would have been much bigger, like, you know, in your face. In your face, yes. And um, the temperature of the studio would have been cold for everybody who had been standing on the sidelines, but comfortable for us because we were standing under these lights. So, you know, the, the technology itself and it hasn't really changed other than the fact that it's gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. And more automated, like you think about uh, this. Yes, this exact <laughs> yeah. stuff. The, the the camera shots that are being picked as, as you and I talk is yeah. is a computer doing that, as opposed to a, a human being actually sitting there and looking at what's going on. The these camera shots are locked off. They're not zooming in or zooming out on us when we do anything entertaining. They're they're not adding anything to the conversation. And there's a certain artwork to a camera operator like i was saying like it's one of the things i always wanted to do and i still love doing it that that we have lost in all this and and there's a certain frustration to the automation of it hmm. are you working on um, any projects currently yes yeah yeah, really? yeah several can you talk about them well there's one that's recorded in this very studio called, called hoppy history cool and um yeah the reason i wore this shirt yep is because uh one of our latest episodes andy nita from nita brewery came on cool and had a great conversation about the history of beer tents. And there is a very re specific reason why walnut trees and beer gardens are connected. And it goes back hundreds of years. Hmm. 
And you're going to have to watch the episode oh, yeah, of yeah, Poppy yeah. History. I right? was waiting for you to explain yeah. but yeah. No. Go watch the episode. Keep it going. will be in the description. Yes, link and subscribe. Or yeah. whatever it is. <laughs> uh, so the Hoppy History is yeah, one of the projects you're working yep. on. Not getting paid. But nevertheless, we're, we're taking some um, uh, stories. Hey, one day, man. It'll come. Yeah, It'll come. Yeah, that's the vision. Yeah, yep. taking some stories and and combining that with, with human history. Another episode just... Well, you know, honestly wondered if if human evolution would have happened if it wasn't for alcohol. Mm. So there's there's some really kind of fun conversations going on over there. Uh, doing a wine podcast as as well, which you know is is doing some of this fun stuff where we're we're doing some odd pairings and and really trying to make wine just accessible to everybody, right? Like you walk into every single one of us does does the same thing. You walk into the booze store and you see aisles and aisles and aisles of bottles, and you pick the one with the pretty label. That's literally what I did. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> is it the right one? Is it the wrong one? Hey, I don't know. It's good. Yep. It exactly. works. Oh, one of the other things I love about wine is is they will say we have a tendency to to uh, pick bottles of wine that have names that we can pronounce, hmm. which is why Josh is so popular, right? Yeah. yeah. Jacob's Creek. Jacob's Creek. Yeah. yeah. Are are these good bottles? Are they they do they're are they good priced? I don't know. But you can look at it and. Say it as opposed to these sort of names, where um, who knows what any of it actually means. So you will you will buy it because it's comfortable and feels right. Maybe there's something else on there that was two dollars cheaper that you would have liked better. So a lot of what the wine podcast tries to do is is explore that sort of stuff. Mm. Uh, and then because I was born in the United States, so I am for whatever reason better or for worse the co-chair for the Democrat Party for this part of the world okay and uh we do a podcast i do a podcast with the democrats as well nice. so it's it's my democrats abroad group which is people who are like me who are american citizens but living outside of the united states and one of the weird things about the united states is you can live in other countries but still vote in u.s elections really yeah canada doesn't do that if if you're a canadian living in in germany you can't vote you know, in Canadian elections. Yeah. If you're an American living in Germany, you vote based on the last address that you had in the United States. So you can still vote for president and senator and, and uh, House of Representatives and all that sort of stuff based on where it is. So this this group that I'm involved with is is taking people who are in my sort of situation and, and making sure that you're aware of the fact that you can vote and then explaining sort of how you get your ballot and, and just trying to have conversations, global conversations about U.S. politics and how it affects you. I find that very. Uh, I, I find that pretty. Uh, you know, uh, it's nice to see that a country still allows their citizens to to vote. You know, to have a say in their country because they are born there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it it started because of soldiers <laughs> living abroad, right? So uh, <laughs> the the concept sort of goes back to the basic feeling of if if you're in the army or the navy or or whatever it is, and and you're living overseas, you sh you are allowed to vote back in the United States. So. Once that was became a thing, then well, like, why can't everybody else who happens to be living in the who have like a big connection to the United States and still have some ability to vote in those elections? And and for them, it had sort of expanded into a thing. For Canada, it's not a thing at all. Back to wine. Yeah, where did you develop the fascination towards wine? Is, is it one night you had this <laughs> this beautiful Bordeaux or whatever? No, no. Uh, on the show since the beginning, like there was always a need for for some sort of a wine segment or yeah. some sort of a booze segment. Yeah. So, so the guy who was doing it when we first started the segment used to be like the spokesperson for the LCBO, and and those were quite fun days because you know we could do a, a booze segment and he could just go and pick whatever off the shelf yeah. and, and bring it in. Yeah. So we got to try a whole lot of really good stuff. Uh, times change, and you know you could no longer like cover that but but just when you start to do these segments on the radio not once or twice not 10 times or 20 times but like 100 or 200 times you start to find things that you like and things that you don't like and it's, it's not necessarily wine like i'm a bit of a drinker yeah. i have a bit of a problem <laughs> yeah. and help me yeah <laughs> show me where the sales are welcome to like, therapy talk yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, this I is an intervention dave i don't i don't want to stop <laughs> i just want to spend less and drive less the, uh, the so a, a lot of it is is something you you find that you're going to do anyways like we're all going to drink it's it's yeah. it's something that we're going to do so once you go along the way and you start to to find what you like and and find what you don't like, then 
you you accidentally become a wine guy, even though you never said. <laughs> set out to be a wine yeah, guy yeah, yeah. because you'll go to somebody's house and they'll put down a bottle and you look at that and go do you have any beer <laughs> and and then you realize well i didn't i didn't mean to be a snob i just happened to know i don't like that particular yeah bottle. your wine's dog shit like yeah, well, <laughs> you might like it you know it's it's entirely up to you and, yeah. and and you have to be very accepting of the fact that if if i don't like this that's fine. Yeah. You might love this. And it's, it's not up to me to tell you that you can't... I'm not going to tell you my opinion of your wine. I'm going to tell you what I like and goes, ask if, if you have any beer. It goes back to the piece of uh, art, too. Yeah. Every wine is different, you know? Every, every, every person's going to have their, you know, different opinions on it, for sure. Everybody's, gonna, everybody's palate is different. Everybody's past is different. What everybody likes is, is, is different. And that's all acceptable. It's, it's finding what works. And, and so you become a bit of a wine snob, I think, along the way when you, when you start to realize what you like and what you don't like. And, and you know, as we were talking about, you and I are, are both, both storytellers. So maybe sometimes you can, well, and we're also, quite frankly, sort of big guys. So, you know, maybe you can... Uh, we can express our opinion in a little bit more forceful way than we should be allowed to. Yeah, my voice isn't soft, all right? <laughs> no, no, and you're not small. I, yeah, yeah, both of us could, could move a room the way we want to move a room. Absolutely. And is that appropriate? Is that right? I don't know. It's me. Yes, exactly. And I had a couple of glasses of wine, and I'm going to tell you what I think. <laughs> yeah. Listen here. Listen here. <laughs> Your wine's crap. Any uh, local breweries? That uh, you prefer? Uh, a lot of them, actually. And, and actually, one of the ones in, in um, Hoppy History also showed up was Kitchissippi. So Paul Meek from Kitchissippi came nice. on and talked about his stuff as well. Uh, local breweries are, are so um, entertaining. In, in, in what that, sense? Well, you can go into some of them. And, and I won't say which one, but I was drinking in it a couple of weeks ago. And... I didn't love any single one of their beers. And, and oh my God. I, I, I do find a lot of times you can go into a brewery and a brewmaster will present you a beer and you'll say, I don't like this. And a brewmaster will go, well, that's fine. Here's six other beers that we make. Like, find the one you, you like. fucking like one of them. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But every now and then you can, can go into a brewery and, and you try a beer. And it's, you know, it's not bad enough that you send it back. It's just not good enough that you get a second one. So you, so you try another one of the beers on the list. Same sort of thing. I don't want a second one of this one, then another one, then another one. And and it really becomes a challenge to find the one you like. But that's part of the fun of the whole thing, too, is is trying it out. I do worry a little bit about breweries. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm a drinker in an era when drugs are taking over. Like, mm. I've tried to do drugs, and I, I just prefer drinking. You know? yeah. Cannabis is legal. To each his own. Yes. Yeah. It, you know, it's, it's entirely acceptable. So That's what it's there for, too, to have the option. You yes. know what I mean? It's not a fucking obligatory there. Mm. No. Yeah. No. I just like drinking. There you go. Yeah. And, and I do worry about some of our local breweries mm -hmm. that, that are starting to disappear and pull back. People are drinking less beer at the moment and finding other ways to enjoy their evenings. And... And that worries me a little bit because, you know, beer is so delicious. Hmm. Do you think the accessibility of cannabis um, is a problem? No, not really. No? No. I think the price is a little bit of a problem. When we, the, the story of the past couple of weeks that in Ontario, the, the government cut is 44%. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So in, if, if the whole idea of legalizing cannabis was try to ensure that everybody is safe, everybody is open of it. One of the worst things about any any vice is when you do it quietly by yourself, you know, at home and you hide it from everybody. And and one of my kind of my frustrations with a lot of things is is it turns out, you know, people have certain addictions, certain problems and and because society looks down on them, they're they're just not allowed to discuss it even with their the the, the boys like, and legal or not they're still going to use there's still there's always going to be users yes it's not going to go away no so this fantasy land of fucking you know what i mean like uh, illegal like you know making everything illegal it, to me it's it, it's absurd man yes it really is like they should have i'm not saying fucking legalized cocaine and, no. and whatever but we should have the choice yes because or or at least 
uh, how illegal it is. Like we we can make this something where you don't go to jail for, you pay a fine for, or whatever it users is. Users will like, use. Yeah. Users are going to use, and and in the only way that we can actually have a conversation about how to make things better is to be open and honest about what's going on. So the whole concept with cannabis, I've got I've got no problem with. It's it's not my thing. Mm -hmm. But I, I've got no problem with anybody who wants to enjoy it. Well, you got no choice because it's on every fucking, <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> every corner. From where where I live? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of it. Are you close to downtown? Uh, yeah, I'm right downtown. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right, yeah. So literally every fucking corner. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> it's 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 kind of entertaining, especially when when you when you look at the different styles of them too, because you go to these stores and and they're really quite classy. A lot of them, and sometimes in, in the people you have conversations with them are, are it's it's really well done. It's just the dilemma, as we have all sort of seen, is people are going back to their dealers because the stuff that the stores are selling is expensive and not as potent as what they can get from the place they've been buying from ten years ago. Do you think the United States government will legalize cannabis on a federal level ever? It's a tough call. I mean, this is still that's still a country where there will always be that state. You know what I mean? They'll say no. <laughs> Yes. You know? Well, remember, you still got to be 21 to drink in the United States. Yeah. Which. What's your opinion on that? I, I think that's bonkers. And, and I, I connect a lot of that to just, you know, at what point do you become an adult? And I would assume that the moment you can join the army is kind of when you become an adult. If you like, can go die for your country, you should have a, be able to have a beer. You should be able to have a beer. Yeah. yeah. And, and growing up in Manitoba, the drinking age is 18. So it's, it's even fascinating in, in where we live on the border between Ontario and Quebec, where it's 18, 19, and 21, you know. All the 18-year-olds from Ontario come over to Quebec. I yes. know, you worked at the fucking casino, right? Yes, <laughs> they are, absolutely they yeah. do. In, in, in Winnipeg, all the 18-year-olds came up from North Dakota. And, you know, they would sit in a bar in Winnipeg and, and just look around and go, wow, we could sit Canadian here. Canadian strip clubs, wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we could. We can drink. It's like, yeah, have another Coors Light, man. Like, it's what fine. What do I do with all these tunies? <laughs> <laughs> strippers with bruises and shit. Uh, yeah. uh, the classic stripper stories. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh man. So, um, you like? Do you regret moving to Ottawa, or you think this is actually a beautiful city, man? Because I think it's thriving right now, and I think uh, platforms like this, uh, artists out there, um, I think that we have a lot of good talent, and I think that the future of the city is in good hands. I think so too. It's 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 entertaining on a street level. <clears throat> on a street level. Yeah. Well, Ottawa is Ottawa is, is dare I say because this will be somewhat controversial, so well run that we really worry about things that I sometimes worry if it's as big of a deal as we like to think it is. <laughs> you know, the the LRT at the moment yep. is is a massive story because it's been offline for a couple of weeks. Edmonton just built a brand new LRT, about to turn it on, and then they realized that they installed the wrong overhead cables and are replacing 140 kilometers worth of cables before they turn on their new LRT. Of taxpayers Montreal money. just got a new LRT, and on the first day they turned it on, the system failed. So they, the, the problems with these trains are, are not exclusive to any particular city. We seem to be having worse growing pains than a lot of other cities, but we're not exclusive to this sort of stuff. And... This feeling that somehow or other Ottawa is in deep trouble, I just, I just don't buy. This, this city is so welcoming, so safe, so acceptable, and, and it, it's just fine. And, and I think the economy is fine. I think the, the way that the politicians are going will be fine. You know, there's a certain bunch of little nitpicky things. Like we were talking about the Ottawa Senators. It would be nice if the Red Blacks won a game. It would be nice if the economy turned around. It would be nice if, if the federal government could figure out what they're going to do with all the buildings downtown because after going through COVID and those just being empty and sitting there, it's like, well, if you're not going to use them, get rid of them so that we can find another use for these things. So there's, there's a certain frustration in the city that I think things don't move fast enough. But the city itself is great. Hmm. Is, what is the, uh, the most beautiful city you've ever been to? Like, you probably traveled a lot during your, uh, your career. What is the nicest place you've been to? No, I don't really get to travel all that much. Like, no? No, and, and I honestly, one of the things that I... Because you're local? Wait, you were, sorry. Yeah, well, yeah. one of the things... Oh, sure, rub that in. Fuck. <laughs> but one of the things that... that Subtle nuance. <laughs> that, that you sort of think is going to happen when you get into these jobs. Oh, yeah, here. We still got oh, another bottle of wine to go through. Oh Lord, okay. The um, when you get any of these jobs, is you're actually going to have a chance to travel and see the world. But but the reality is the the grind of something like a daily radio show means 
that you've got to be in the studio Monday to Friday, 6 a.m. Yeah. to 9 a.m. And listeners don't like it when you're not there because you become a part of the basic routine on, on every single thing that, that – so there's no sick days. There's no sick days. There's there's even vacations. Like, you know, you sort of got to time them carefully and, and do them fairly quickly. You can't be gone more than a week at a time because then people start to wonder about what it is. So I've done actually very little travel over the past couple of years. Since I've been unemployed, it's been great. <laughs> I actually get to go out and see a lot of things. So be beautiful cities is is really tough. There's certainly lots of, of beautiful nooks and crannies and areas, like even the small towns around here. Me and some buddies took a, a boat to Montreal two weeks ago. So uh, a friend who has got a boat that's just down at the Marina de All, like next to the Canadian Museum of History, that all he's ever done is take it around in circles, like to, to Kettle Island and, and Upper Duck and Lower Duck and stuff. And he's never taken the boat anywhere, and he just wanted to take the boat to Montreal. Turns out it's really complicated to take a boat from Ottawa to Montreal. <laughs> really? You've got to go through four locks to get there. You know, it's it's about 150 kilometers on the water. In a car, that's nothing. But in the water, you are doing do you do 40 kilometers an hour, but it's really uncomfortable and not nice. And and the river has some very, very shallow parts, and, and it's just not an easy thing to do. So, so you do not recommend? No, I just recommend getting there. <laughs> uh, well, you start to realize quite quickly on that trip, I'm in way over my head. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. You think you know what you're doing, and then all of a sudden you're on this massive boat trip to Montreal. Like, I don't know what's going on or how we're going to get there or what exactly the route is up the river because, you know, the, any sort of river has got shallow spots and deep spots and, mm. and knowing where that is and trying to remember, is the red one supposed to be on your left or your right? Is Where's the green one supposed to be? So... However, when you do that sort of thing, you you also find some very beautiful nooks and crannies of this country that that you can't see from the road, you can't see from a trail. You you realize that the amount of people who were as lucky enough as me to have a buddy who owns a boat that we could take to Montreal, yeah, and all of a sudden you're sure. you're in the middle of the Ottawa River as the sun sets and you've dropped anchor and you're barbecuing with your boys, and it's like. This is absolutely stunning. And where exactly is this? I don't know. But it's, it's a really pretty part of Canada. I can tell you like to experience life. Oh, you have to. Yeah. Yeah. I'm single at the moment. So I think that I'm single and unemployed. So it, it sort of means there's not a lot of rules. Were you um, always like that? Were you always? Uh, no. No? No, no. I've been through a whole lot of different things. But, but at the moment, when, when those sort of things happen to, to coexist at the same time, <laughs> really kind of means that all of a sudden... There's, there's a lot of time to go out and kind of do whatever you want to do and, and no negotiation, no, oh, you got to be home by this time or, you know, we got to go to grandma's house or something. It's, it's just whatever you feel like. So it's a good time to get out and, and do a lot of adventuring. That shows you, too, the importance of saying yes sometimes, you know, getting out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Do you think getting out of your comfort zone created the career that, uh, you know, you ventured down? I th Career path. Yeah, you know, yeah. There's always an adventure to take. There's always something new to learn. I think one of the things we talk about, uh, you and I, as both as, as storytellers, is we're sort of endlessly out for the new story, the next story. We're not about being doctors or pilots or lawyers where all you're ever kind of doing is learning something really, really well and then recreating it over and over and over again. The, the objective is always to find something new. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the funnest things about doing this exact sort of thing, whether anybody's paying for it or not, is, is finding something brand new. And maybe that's a new wine or whatever it is, but that's, that's what makes the adventure. And sometimes the adventure is, you know, zip lining or driving a race car really fast around a track and and there's a certain high to that there's also a certain simplicity to just walking in the store and and knowing a good bottle to buy because it's one that you learned about on your show a week ago i think that's just a part of the human experience yeah you know always seeking discomfort always seeking new activities new experiences to you know help you develop as a human being well we often talked about that on the radio show of uh, one of the things about media, what media needs to do at its its best is to be familiar. You know, at six in the morning when you roll out of bed, you might like you might not be in a good place, but you you turn on your radio, you turn on your TV. Fuck, it's Dave, man. Dave's still there. And there's you know? the consistency, yeah. right? And being able to to provide that consistency, but but also being able to 
provide a little bit of a surprise, a little bit of insight. You you can't do the same show today that you did yesterday. You've got to have a brand new show with brand new things. So you've got to be sort of consistently inconsistent to, to make it work. I like that. And, and that's one of the big tricks of what the, the daily grind of, of the, the radio shows or the TV shows. And, and you know, they use look at some of the big TV shows, and, and they're kind of alive and well for you turn on the TV and there's some happy people there that are the same people that were there yesterday talking about something different. And it's, it's the familiarity that makes it work. Do you ever have an ex uh, inspiration from, like, a, um, I don't know, uh, a movie or something from when you were a kid? Like, did anything really, like, click that, you know, that love, that spark for uh, storytelling? Well, the, yeah. So the class of the MY generation, when you talk about that stuff, is WKRP in Cincinnati. Okay. You know, this sitcom that was on TV years and years and years ago about an under, underfunded radio station and the adventures that they went through trying to find an audience. And, and the endless gimmick of the radio station was it was this new program manager who came along and switched it to a rock format. And the troubles that they got into when they started playing rock music on the radio station and, and slowly turned it into a success. So it was, it was a whole bunch of people who, you know, the person who delivers news but doesn't really know how to deliver news, the person who's trying to sell the radio station but not really knowing how to sell the radio station. The highest paid employee at the radio station was the receptionist because she just happened to be gorgeous. So, Jeez. you know, yeah. it's, that's the era. That's the era. And, and when you watch that sort of sitcom, there's things that they went in through on that, that that still resonate as as being really familiar and comfortable and hilarious at the same time, because it was based on such a simple concept. Hmm. What did you grow up watching in, uh, in Iowa? Mm. Ooh, that's a very different one. Um, so I'm. I am what you would call the accidental American. Like, I never really grew up in the United States. I was born in the United States. My, my parents are Canadian. They're from Manitoba, both, oh, okay. both from small farms, Manitoba. Dad was going to the University of Iowa. So my dad is a doctorate in agriculture. He's a doctor farmer. Iowa State or Iowa? Iowa State. <laughs> okay. Iowa State. Okay. Yes, I know. It's like, holy fuck. <laughs> Iowa yeah. State. Yeah. The, uh, so mom and dad were living in the United States for a couple of years while dad was going to university. And so I was born on U.S. soil to Canadian citizens. So I left the United States when I was like two and a half. So I okay. had no real memories of any of it. But you end up with this accidental connection and accidental abilities to this uh, uh, to vote in the United States that, you know, you never really asked for, never really wanted. And for a lot of people in my position, they even look at that as a liability to a certain extent, that, that you – you have to worry about this entirely other country that means nothing to you in any way because you have no connection to it other than the fact that you were born there. But you never really lived there and don't really know any of it. I'm supposed to be, you know, you have to file taxes as a part mm -hmm. of living outside of the United States as well, which seems sort of silly when you have nothing to do with the United States. So, yeah. so, yeah. so as far as living in Iowa, yeah, I don't know. Went back a couple of times. There's a lot okay. of cornfields and pigs, but yeah, but it's it's just kind of a and Waterloo, Iowa, the hometown of John Wayne Gacy. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> I pulled that one out of my ass too. Excellent, nicely done. <laughs> fuck, man. So, um, <laughs> yeah, fuck. I, I, what am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> I don't know. Win a bar bet somewhere. I would hope. <laughs> would you ever move back to the states, or would you ever move to the states, sir? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. For yeah. sure. You know, the, well, like I was saying, just to be single and unemployed at the moment is one of the advantages that comes with that is is being able to pick up and move wherever ever it is you want to move. So, you know, if the right job came along in the right place, yeah, why not? Yeah, it's, so right now you're just freelancing? Oh, right now I'm living off severance. So I, I'm, I'm, there's no money coming in at the moment. I'm just kind of enjoying it. And, and part of the dilemma is just summers in Canada, nothing happens. Yeah, that's true. So... Nobody's, there's, there's not a lot of jobs, there's not a lot of opportunities at the moment. You just kind of have to wait for summer to run its course and, and wait and see where September goes and, and see what comes along. Dave, what makes Canada great? I would say... A lot of people are talking shit on Canada right yeah. now. What makes Canada great? Yeah, I, I would say it's, it's our natural resources that we, we still don't quite know what to do with. And, and by natural resources, I, I, I will leave that as a very vague term as well. Like, I do love the elbow room in Canada that we have. There's, there's lots of space here for everybody to do what they want. There's a, a, a lot of 
of beautiful rivers and lakes and trees and and big like these blue skies that we that we love and also neglect and and neglect and sometimes can't quite figure out what to do with but but it's it's the it's the ability that we have in this country to have all this extra space. And, and when you do travel a little bit and you go to some of the bigger cities in the world and you look at, or, or even some cities in Canada, quite frankly, where, you know, downtown Toronto or Montreal, and, and you look at all these people crammed into these tiny little things and, and you wonder, why are you, why are you crammed into here? One of the things that Canada has is some space, you know, get out and make some use of it. So I'd, I'd say that's definitely one of the best things about this country. Wow. I, I, a lot of people are afraid to say it, but I am proud. Uh, even though you know you, whatever your opinion is of on the current states of the uh, of the country, but I am a proud Canadian, and I think a lot of people should realize that uh, you know it's a beautiful country. It's a beautiful country, yeah. and and uh, you think about like look at American politics at the moment. There's a there's a lot of confusion in American politics is uh, that Trump has brought into the system, right? And 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 people trying to actually bring some destabilizing to the whole concept of democracy and can you actually count ballots properly and and what do you get and and that just seems like a frustrating battle to be having and and the fact that people are believing the rhetoric is is really quite frustrating so mm-hmm. i'm quite glad that in canada we're not having that conversation where there is still a fundamental belief in you know the majority wins like that's you, true. You, that's true. It may not have been the person that you wanted to win, but you voted for him. But the majority, more, more people voted for the other person, so you just have to sort of accept the fact that that's that's the way that it is going to go. And it's it's not that that the system is messed up. It's it's that you lost. So yeah. you know, and there is a state there is a state of frustration here too as well. I think I don't know. I think I'm not. I don't follow politics. I'm apolitical. I don't. I don't associate with either party because look, we're humans. There's corruption on both sides. There's corruption sure. everywhere. So to in my opinion, I'm. I just. I don't know. I just stay out of it. I don't. You know, read up on it or I don't. You know, that's my decision to take. I do still vote. Yeah. So. Yeah, but yeah. we've also seen this in Canada too. Like the people are talking about a little bit about the division in Canada in in politics at the moment, and I just. Say, well, remember the 90s when Quebec almost separated. Like, yeah. that that whole moment in the 90s when Quebec had the referendum and it came down to the thinnest of margins for if Quebec was going to leave Canada or not, to me still feels way more divisive than anything we're going through at the moment. Like, that was a, a true moment in Canadian history where you actually worried about your country and the stability of your country. How was that? It was really scary. You know, and, and FLQ, the uh, Front Libero, Libéral, Libéral, uh, Quebec, whatever. Uh, um, well, this was the Bloc Québécois and the Parti Québécois. So the FLQ was back in the 60s. So that, that was the 60s. That was the 60s, okay. yeah. I'm talking about the So that was another scary moment. Yeah. But, but like living through the 90s where where the, the rise of separatism in Quebec and the, and the feeling that, that Quebec could be its own country mm-hmm. and, and Quebec would be better off if it was its own country is is not a new conversation like this this conversation i think happens in in bars in in most parts of the world on a fairly regular basis but the fact that that we saw the rise of the bloc québécois and the parti québécois and quebec actually put the question out to the people should we leave canada and become our our own country and the the build up to that vote over those past couple those couple of months where we saw that coming together and then the night when the vote happened and it came down to literally like 50.1 percent decided to stay in canada so it was it was thin what would have been the repercussions from that we did we still don't know and that was part of the big conversation with the rest of canada is is okay quebec if you're going to separate what does that mean? Like, if you're going to form form your own country, okay, you can form your own country. But so do you understand that means currency and passports and and military and and a whole lot of stuff? And, and, the, and the whole vision at the point at, at that point was so could Quebec could protect its culture. Okay, you can protect your culture, but the economy is a very different thing. And and we look at economies in in uh, in Europe and stuff where they realize that we're actually better off together to be working together as economy with fewer walls between us instead of like putting up arbitrary walls. So it was a very odd time in Canadian history. And, and I still think that particular moment in the nineties was way scarier than anything we're seeing now. Hmm. I, I need your opinion. Cause you were probably working in the industry while it was happening, uh, while this was happening, nine 11, 
Mm -hmm. Where were you when 9-11 happened? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what a question. <laughs> yeah. Pulled that one out of my ass too, dude. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> very nice. So um, I wasn't in the industry, actually, at that oh, point. Oh, okay. No, um, for 9-11, I was, I was living in Winnipeg. I had gone back to Winnipeg for some work and um, was working for a computer company. I was a webmaster. I was developing e-commerce websites. <laughs> and 9-11, when it happened, was, was very interesting because... Uh, internet was was not new at that point. You know, internet had been around for a good 15 years, but it was still kind of finding its way. And so we were all at work when 9-11 when happened. And when you're at work and you're trying to figure out what's going on for news, you know, you, you go to a, the website. But every single website in the world was overloaded. So CNN, CBC, all that stuff. Like, you couldn't get into them no matter how hard you tried. And no office has a computer, but a lot of offices have a radio. So yeah. my distinct memory of 9-11 was somebody finding a radio somewhere and pulling out the radio and setting it on somebody's desk and turning on the radio and all of us sitting around the radio listening to, to CBC do a live radio broadcast about what was happening in New York City. And it felt like something out of World War I, quite frankly, where you're, all you have is, is the images in your head of what's coming together and how odd and scary and confusing that moment in history was. Wow. That must have been crazy. Seen it live, like especially when the, the, the second plane hit. I was at work. Yeah, I didn't have a TV at work. So, you know, a, a lot of people talk about how they were watching TV and, and saw that moment happen and, and how weird it was. And then to see that plane hit and then to see the buildings themselves actually collapse, to, to see that come tumbling down, all covered live on, on television. And then the repercussions of it, which took months and months and months. And to a certain extent, we're still feeling that today. Mm. But I don't know. Like, and now, like, like, it seems that world events were... were, were becoming numb to the atrocities that this world is you know going through right now you know 9 11 of course like the you know if, if you would have walked down the street and you know saw a tv or whatever and mm -hmm. seen that happen it would have been crazy but now you can see like i don't know you can see like live war from your phone mm -hmm. what do you think that impact has does it make does it like normalize it for us does it like what like what impact does that have on society as a, as a whole the dilemma is, is information overload, which is one part of it. The other dilemma is that we are losing what the 6 o'clock news or the morning newspaper would do, which is where a human would look at the important news and the not-so-important news and on the front page of the newspaper you know, post the facts of what's happening. Now, every single website is determined to give us our personalized news feeds. So we have gone from the concept of a curated feed where I, people actually sat and thought about what is truly important to this concept of a personalized news feed where an algorithm has thought about not what's important, but what do you want to see? What sells? For you. Yeah. What sells for you. Exactly. Which is different than what sells for me, mm. which is the problem where people have opinions and all that happens is their opinions get reinforced over and over and over again because that's all that the algorithms ever feed them is the things that the algorithms know that they want to see. So it, what worries me is as we step away from the, the truly curated news and we have this concept of whatever you clicked on today, you're probably going to click on tomorrow, well, I don't know. I clicked on a stupid little story about uh, some dog that really liked a criminal that broke into a garage. That doesn't mean that I want to see dog stories all day long. That was just something that I was enjoying for that particular moment. And so I can see how the problem with news at the moment just becomes trying to figure out exactly what's important and wasn't important. And we do see this all the time that that there will be a, a train crash in India where 150 yeah. people died. Mm -hmm. And that gets buried in our news feeds, you know. And the fact that the LRT was five minutes late seems to be the headline. It's, is this important? Hmm. That's true. Wow. And, oof. Now you're going serious, eh? Yeah. 
I was going to go somewhere, but uh, I got to stop my brain because it's not. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, you can always do a part two. We don't have to cover it all. Of this. Hey, we always we will do a part two. But Dave, <laughs> before we go, man, I just want your um, with your, you know, years of expertise, your wisdom. Yep. Um, do you have any advice for anybody who would or who are storytellers like us that want to start off today? Oh, yeah. Do what we're doing. No, the the the. Whether or not anybody actually watches it becomes irrelevant. You know, you, you have to do it. You have to look at it. You have to critique yourself. You have to learn how the tools work. You have to show it to your friends. You have to show it to anybody who will watch it. You have to listen to what they say. If, if they are telling you that, oh, you went a little bit long here or that was a little short or, you know, the camera shot isn't right, you have to listen to all of that and, and know that they're not out to get to you. They're just giving you some advice. But I honestly think in, in this sort of a thing, there's not really a lot that, that people can truly teach you other than you have to do it and you have to learn what works and what doesn't work for you. And the only way to do that is to do it and do it over and over and over again. And, and that's how you find your personal style and what works. And, and you have to have some originality if you're going to succeed at all. You can't be yet another one crashing out the same thing that, that everybody else is already doing. And, and you've got to do a lot of trial and error to be able to find that. Wow. Dave, where can people reach you? Um, Listen to you. The internet? There you go. Yeah. Great answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it will be in the description. Don't It'll worry. be in the description. Yeah. I, um, yeah. You know, get, I'm certainly not going anywhere. I'm, I'm just hanging around. So it's, I'm not hard to find anybody who wants to find me. But, but yeah, there's a bunch of good podcasts to check out, and, and we'll see what the future holds. Cool. Guys, thank you for listening and watching. Like, subscribe, share, and I will see you next week. Have a great night. Peace.